In 1940, Heber J. Grant, seventh president of the church, suffered a serious stroke. The doctor told him the paralysis on his left side was permanent, but the 83-year-old prophet would not accept it. He pleaded for hope. He was told that he could try squeezing a sponge to regain strength in his left hand, but the doctor did not expect significant results. President Grant sent his nephew to buy a sponge right away. The two stayed up most of that first night, but their efforts were fruitless. Days passed, and the doctor returned. President Grant asked the doctor to give him the scout handshake. Sensitive to the prophet's partial paralysis, the doctor extended his right hand. But President Grant quickly reminded the doctor that the scout handshake is always given with the left hand. Obedient to the prophet, the doctor extended his left hand. To his utter astonishment, President Grant raised his own left hand and powerfully squeezed the doctor's hand. Moved by the amazing accomplishment, the doctor wept. President Grant's efforts to regain strength after his stroke epitomize what we know about the seventh president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He had an incredible capacity to overcome obstacles and to persist at all cost in turning weaknesses into strengths. But certainly there is more to this man of God than persistence. His genius in the field of finance and business virtually saved the church from financial ruin. He was also the driving force behind the self-sufficiency that Latter-day Saints are known for, including the church welfare program. And during his 60-plus years of high church leadership, he led the church from a mostly antagonistic relationship with the world to one of friendly and respectful admiration. But most of all, Heber J. Grant was a man of enormous charity, incredible faith, and humble determination. To all he touched, there was no question that he was a modern prophet of God. Jedediah Morgan Grant, Heber's father, came from English and Scottish forebears who had farmed the rocky Connecticut soil for four generations. Jedediah's father Joshua, however, was a lumberman whose work took him to New York, where Jedediah was born in February of 1816. Growing up in Windsor, Jedi, as he was called, was introduced to Mormonism at the age of 17 and was soon baptized in the icy waters of a nearby river. He then went on to serve four proselyting missions and become a member of the First Council of the Seventy, and later was called as the first counselor to Brigham Young. Jedediah Grant was a real folk hero. He was an Indian fighter, an eloquent speaker, uh, energetic, uh, charismatic personality. And on top of all of that, he was the first mayor of Salt Lake City, apostle and a member of the First Presidency under President Brigham Young. Rachel Ridgway Ivins, Heber's dear mother, was a descendant of Dutch immigrants. Born in 1821 in New Jersey, Rachel lost her father when she was only six and her mother when she was just nine. With her parents gone, she was taken in by Quaker relatives. However, as she grew, Rachel found the Quaker lifestyle too rigid. And so, at the age of 16, she joined the Baptist Church. Like Sometime introduce... later, while visiting an uncle, Rachel, along with her sister and a girlfriend, attended a meeting held by Mormon elders. One of the missionaries was none other than Jedediah M. Grant. When Rachel's minister heard of it, he told her to discontinue her activities or she would be disciplined. Rachel was quite impressed by the very first Mormon missionary that she'd ever met, and that was a, a, quite a dynamic Mormon missionary by the name of Jedediah Grant. She heard him preach in uh, her area where she was growing up. Um, so it's interesting that she would have that contact with a man that would later actually become her husband. She eventually uh, moved to Nauvoo in 1842, 
uh, she became very well acquainted with the prophet Joseph Smith. And in fact, we know that Joseph Smith was interested in her hand in marriage and talked to her privately about becoming one of his plural wives. Um, this was a great shock to Rachel. She'd never heard of the principle of plural marriage, and it was very confusing to her and something that she thought about very hard, but wasn't sure that this was something that she could accept. It wasn't long after that that Joseph Smith, along with his brother Hiram, were killed. And so when the saints came west, uh, Rachel decided to go back to her home in New Jersey. Years later, however, Rachel's faith was rekindled and she determined to again join the saints. Her concerned brothers exerted great pressure on her to stay, offering her a lifetime annuity if she would abandon her plans, but her heart was pointed west. She arrived in the Salt Lake Valley in 1853 and was reintroduced to Jedediah Grant. Within two years, she became Jedediah's seventh wife, and shortly thereafter, a child was on the way. Unfortunately, tragedy too was on the horizon. In 1854, President Young sent out the fiery preacher Jedediah Grant. In an effort to reawaken the saints to their spiritual and temporal duties in what came to be known as the Great Mormon Reformation of 1854, Jedediah was tireless. His preaching was powerful and direct. When you are right, we will cease to chastise. We will cease to rebuke. We will cease telling you to surrender, to repent of all your sins. But until you do this, we will continue to throw the arrows of the Almighty through you, to hurl the darts of heaven upon you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we do not mean to surrender to evil. From town to town, Jedediah's preaching had the intended effect. One Utah settler recalled, the words flowed from his mouth like a great river. We've never heard a man before or since who spoke with greater power. But Jedediah Grant had driven himself beyond his limits. On December 1st, 1856, at the young age of 40, he succumbed to a combination of typhoid and pneumonia. Not since the double deaths of Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram had the saints mourned so openly. At his funeral, you, President Young addressed the crowd. No Brother Grant, we call a great man, a giant, did. a liar. And let and me the tell you, the young women there are play. young whelps growing up here who will roar louder than ever he dared. And the we very sons of these women that sit here will rise up and be as great as any man who ever lived. lived. In a crib on a balcony overlooking the funeral scene was perhaps one such whelp. Born on November 22, 1856, he was 13-day-old Heber J. Grant, Jedediah's newborn son. Soon after the funeral, Bishop Edwin Woolley blessed Rachel Grant's baby and gave him the name Heber Jetty Ivans Grant. Later, he remarked, Heber is entitled to be one of the apostles, and I know it. At one point, uh, Heber is playing at a social at, uh, at the home of Heber Kimball's. He's named after Heber Kimball. The little boy remembers President Kimball picking him up and putting him on a table. He can't remember much about what he says. He remembers those dark eyes that are such a Kimball family trait. Later on, I think he understands that there was a blessing there, a foretelling of, of destiny. Heber Kimball, in fact, prophesied, as the others had, that young Heber J. Grant was destined to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both humbled by and hopeful for this prophecy, Rachel Grant would often remind her son, Heber, if you just behave yourself, you're going to grow up to be somebody.
As a child, Heber J was happy. And though the financial future of Jedediah's six widowed wives was uncertain, the boy lived until he was six in one of the finest homes in Salt Lake. Its location gave the family membership in Salt Lake's affluent and prestigious 13th Ward, populated with general authorities and prominent merchants. On one side was Edward Hunter, the presiding bishop of the church. On the other was the legendary Welsh-born missionary Daniel Wells. Daniel's daughter Emily was Heber's best friend. And around the corner was none other than Brigham Young. One snowy day, when the president's sleigh passed by, Heber jumped on, intent on riding it to the end of the street. But the sleigh picked up speed, and young Heber soon found himself outside the city and fearful of letting go. Finally, when the driver slowed the sleigh to navigate a stream, Heber jumped from the sleigh and was discovered by the prophet. Realizing that young Heber was nearly frozen, Brigham hefted him into the sleigh and wrapped him in a buffalo blanket. Learning that the boy was none other than the son of his former counselor, Jedediah Grant, President Young told Heber to have his mother send him for a visit in six months' time. Six months later, Heber visited President Young as directed and soon found himself participating in the Young family prayers. He commented, so earnest and powerful were the prayers of President Young that I felt if I opened my eyes, I would surely see the Lord. The idyllic years of Heber's youth were shattered, however, as it soon became evident that the Grant widows could no longer afford their comfortable Main Street home. Unable to find another solution, all six families went their separate ways. The tragic splitting up of Jedediah's widows and their children was dramatic and permanent. Certainly, the separation must have been hard on young Heber. This change in lifestyle was no doubt difficult. The family had to split up. There was no money, essentially. Uh, Rachel Grant and her son had to find a small house in Salt Lake City. and. Uh, very much different from the rather large home that they were used to and the large family that they were used to. These circumstances would provide young Heber J. Grant with the opportunity to uh, develop and grow in ways that perhaps uh, he, would, he would not have had uh, with, with that kind of uh, more affluent uh, background. Heber's determined character was shown not long after he and his mother left the large Main Street house. On his way home from school one day, Heber stopped at his old house. Stepping onto the lot, he sobbed and then shook his fist at the place, vowing that someday he would buy the house back. However, Jedediah's house would be torn down and replaced by ZCMI before Heber could make good on his promise. So, years later, as a successful businessman, Heber bought $350,000 of stock in ZCMI. Now he felt his vow to one day own the old house had been satisfied. As Rachel's only child, Heber J. became the man of the house at six years old. Their new home was a drafty cottage on 2nd East. Taking with them their share of Jedediah's remaining assets, this lonely pair furnished their new home with just a few chairs, six dining plates, a bed, a cup, and a saucer. At night, Heber would sleep in a large ventilated closet so that his room could be used for renters. Brigham Young had offered church aid, but true to character, Rachel firmly declined. Instead, she acquired a sewing machine, and mother and son went to work. Heber remembered, I sat on the floor until midnight and pumped the sewing machine to relieve her tired limbs. Despite her destitute situation, when Rachel earned extra money, she sent her only son to the finest schools available. In his younger years, Heber attended a school directed by Abraham Dorimus and his wife. Heber was a good student who could memorize anything, especially if there was a prize to be won. Of course, he still had the usual run-ins with various teachers, 
One time, he refused to apologize for something he didn't feel was wrong. The schoolmaster commenced whipping him with a willow branch, vowing to continue until he apologized. Heber recorded, He whipped me until he finally, I believe, must have been ashamed of himself and stopped. He could not get me to say I was sorry. Later at the end of the school year, the teacher had come to appreciate this young man and that he was indeed a truthful boy. In fact, he even gave him a slip of paper that had the word truthful on it in uppercase letters. Heber J. Grant kept that for many years. He kept it as a commitment and a reminder to himself that he had always been truthful. After several years at the school of Brother Doremus, Heber was invited to attend a private school in the Brigham Young Schoolhouse, conducted primarily for the children of Brigham Young. Heber was a bright and dedicated student, but he could be mischievous on occasion. Once, when Heber wanted to get back at a fellow student who had soaked his chair with water from a sponge, Heber and some other friends kept telling the boy that he should go look in the mirror because he didn't look well. The boy finally went home feeling very sick, which left Heber J. feeling quite satisfied. In Sunday school, Heber was an exemplary student. However, he was shy and uncertain in front of a crowd. Once he was asked to give a recitation of the word of wisdom to the Sunday school. Usually flawless in his delivery, Heber spotted Brigham Young among the listeners. He stumbled and stuttered until the children were laughing. But he persevered, and afterward, President Young commended him. You were your father's own son by not quitting the rest. As another means of developing himself, Heber played marbles in the spring. In this game, as well as in other endeavors, Heber became an expert, and his pockets frequently bulged with his winnings. Demonstrating an early business sense, Heber would often use his marble winnings to pay the neighborhood boys to do his chores. One day, uh, Heber was playing with his friends on Main Street. They were shooting marbles and a rather dapper-looking man came walking down the street. One of his friends said, Hey, Hebe, you see that guy? He's a bookkeeper for Wells Fargo, and he makes $150 a month. At the time, Heber was making his money shining shoes. He was making a nickel a pair. And he figured out in his mind very quickly that it would take his shining 240 pairs of shoes a day to make the kind of money that bookkeeper was making. He decided then and there that he would learn penmanship, which was important for a bookkeeper, and that he would get a job as a bookkeeper at Wells Fargo. As soon as he could, Heber enrolled in penmanship classes, but found the task difficult and awkward. Classmates jeered at his attempts and called them hen tracks. Finally, Heber could take no more. He pounded the desk with his fist and made a vow to the mocking classmates. I will someday be able to give you fellows lessons in penmanship. Heber's declaration came true. In fact, he later became teacher of penmanship and bookkeeping at the University of Deseret and received a diploma for the best penmanship in the territory. Heber had yet another passion at this point in his life, and he said it best himself. I'm not sure there has ever been an American youth more enthusiastic over baseball than I was. Unfortunately, in Heber's youth, most of his free time had been consumed helping his mother maintain their home. While other boys in the neighborhood were learning to play baseball, Heber was learning other traits. He recorded. As I was an only child, my mother reared me very carefully. I learned to sweep and to wash and wipe dishes, but did little stone throwing. I could not throw the ball from one base to another. I lacked the strength to run or bat the ball. When I would pick up the ball, the boys would generally shout, Throw it here, sissy. 
I solemnly vowed to play baseball in the nine that would win the championship of the territory of Utah. Determined to reach his goal, Heber shined shoes until he saved enough money to buy a baseball. Then he hired the best players to fire bullets at him until he learned to catch. When another player wasn't available, Heber would throw the ball for hours against Bishop Woolley's barn. In time, he earned a spot on the first team as a second baseman, and his team, the Red Stockings, won the Territorial Championship in 1877. Having successfully accomplished his goal, Heber never played baseball again. One rainy day, Bishop Woolley dropped in on Rachel Grant. When he saw how Sister Grant's roof leaked, he told her he would take funds from the fast offering and fix it. Rachel refused, proclaiming that Heber would build her a new house someday. Recalling Heber's recent obsession with baseball, Bishop Woolley told her that if she was waiting for Heber to build her a new house, she would be waiting a long time because Heber was the laziest boy in the whole 13th Ward. Bishop Edwin D. Woolley he was either doubtful of that kind of a commitment that Heber J. would build her a home, or he decided to use some reverse psychology because indeed, by the time Heber J. was 21 years old, he had built a new place for his mother to live. Upon completion of his secondary education, Heber flirted just once with the idea of continuing his education at the college level. When Heber J. Grant finished his secondary education, he expressed some desire to receive a college education. When President George Q. Cannon learned of that, he came to young Heber J. Grant and told him that he would help him to get an appointment at West Point into the Naval Academy, which he was able to do because he was serving as a delegate from the territory of Utah into the Congress of the United States of America. Heber J. Grant said he went home that evening thrilled and excited. He had visions of being a naval officer and traveling throughout the entire world. He said that night I could hardly sleep as I had this great vision of becoming an important man. The next morning, still excited and elated from what President Canada offered to do for him, he noticed tears in his mother's eyes. And he knew that she didn't want him to go. And he looked at her and he told her, Mother, you don't have to worry. I will stay and take care of you. And he did not accept the possible appointment to West Point. Though predominantly occupied with baseball and a growing interest in business as a team, Heber was not without drive in the church. On one occasion, Anthony Ivins, Heber's uncle, challenged Heber and Anthony Jr., his son, to read the Book of Mormon. Whoever completed the book first, he promised, would receive a pair of $10 buckskin gloves. In the first night, Heber's cousin read 150 pages. However, Heber, who read carefully and pondered each verse, completed just 25 pages. But true to form, Heber persisted and finished the book while his cousin lost interest. Heber J. himself recalled the result. I determined to read the book, say, 25 pages a day, and get the benefit of its contents. I believed its contents were true. I thought that to win the gloves, I would have to read the book so rapidly that I would get no benefit and therefore decided to let Anthony win the gloves. I went on reading, and occasionally I got so interested that I read 50 or 75 pages, and lo and behold, I got through first and got the gloves. In Heber's youth, he had another powerful spiritual experience while listening to a pair of elders speak in church. The first elder was an eloquent young man whose testimony was peppered with large and fanciful words. Heber, ever improving himself, wrote down the unfamiliar words on his removable cuff. The second elder, Millen Atwood by name, had no such gift for language. Heber intended to write down all the words he mispronounced, but soon forgot to do so. He later said, I did not write anything more after that first sentence. Not a word. 
When Milton Atwood stopped preaching, tears were rolling down my cheeks. His testimony made the first profound impression that was ever made upon my heart and soul of the divine mission of the prophet Joseph Smith. As a youth in the 13th Ward, Heber also regularly attended parties and dances. Once, when he called to escort a young lady to a dance at a time when his persistence in throwing the ball at Bishop Woolley's barn had earned him an ill-deserved reputation for laziness, he overheard the girl's father declare that his daughter could not go with any such a worthless, shiftless, lazy, good-for-nothing boy as he is. Heber observed, Seeing that the father had such an exalted opinion of me, I quit taking this young lady out. Undaunted in his social endeavors, Heber persisted in dancing and taking dancing lessons. He concluded, I had about as hard a work learning to dance as I did learning to play marbles and write. But I finally mastered it and became a pretty good dancer. Another example of persistence winning related to a cousin that Heber had who lived in New Jersey with whom he became a pen pal. And his cousin sent him a piece of paper the size of a nickel on which he had written the entire Lord's Prayer. Heber took that as a challenge and duplicated the feat. Later, Heber received a letter from that same cousin with the Lord's Prayer written upon a piece of paper the size of a nickel twice. This he accepted as a challenge and sent away for a specially fine pen and using a magnifying glass, finally wrote the Lord's Prayer on a piece of paper the size of a nickel three times. There are 66 words in the Lord's Prayer, so to have written it three times would have required 198 words. He never heard from his cousin again. At the age of 15, Heber became an accounting assistant to an insurance agent. Later, he took on a second job as a bookkeeper for Wells Fargo. Soon after that, he was also keeping books part-time for several mining companies. And after hours, he augmented his growing income even further by writing greeting cards, invitations and announcements with his highly sought-after Spencerian penmanship. One year on New Year's Eve, Heber stayed late after work writing over five dozen cards that read, Happy New Year. Needing extra money, he intended to sell the cards the next day from a local mercantile. Ironically, Heber determined to quit his job the next Monday because he felt he was underworked for the pay he received. But as he worked, his boss came into the office and found him still at work. Impressed with Heber's dedication, his boss pulled out his billfold and said, Here is $100 for a New Year's Eve present. Nobody else in this office will get a dollar because all the other employees watch the clock to see how quickly they can get out. But you come back here nights frequently, and you have done work for me personally, which you volunteered to do. Following this kind gift of gratitude, Heber pondered, I guess I won't resign day after tomorrow. I think that I will stay right here, seeing that the boss feels that way toward me. During this same time, Heber set his goals for the future. And for the most part, they seemed to be financial. He determined to make several hundred dollars a month before he was 25. And he planned on making over 10,000 annually by the time he was 30. Though Heber loved making money in his business ventures, he enjoyed generosity more. From the very days of his youth, he strictly observed the law of tithing. On some occasions, he would pay tithing before receiving an increase because he said he needed the blessings. On one occasion, Heber went to church and he had $50 in his pocket. Now, at that time, that's a lot of money. It's still a lot of money today. And the bishop got up 
and began to preach a sermon about tithing and how important tithing was. And if you paid your tithing, then the Lord would bless you fourfold. Well, Heber J. Grant could do that math. And so he sat there and thought, okay. So he went up and he gave the bishop his $50. And the bishop looked at it, took $5 and gave back 45 And Heber said, no, that's not what I have in mind. You take all the $50 because I'm going to be blessed fourfold. Within the week, he had entered into a business transaction that netted him $218.50. At the next fast meeting, Heber paid the bishop $21.85 and remarked jokingly to him that his promise of a fourfold increase didn't quite hold. He had his $200, but it didn't quite cover the tithing as well. While a young man, Heber received a powerful patriarchal blessing in which he was assured that he would be called to the ministry in his youth. So it was not a great surprise when, in Heber's 18th year, President Brigham Young requested an interview, saying, I think it's about time some of Jedediah's boys were putting on the harness, don't you? By the end of their chat, Heber had agreed to accept a mission call the following spring. In preparation, Heber paid off his debts and began reading about the missionary efforts of George Q. Cannon, Joseph F. Smith, Erastus Snow, and other giants of the gospel who had served their missions as teenagers. Heber attended the Spring General Conference of 1876 with the greatest anticipation. In that period, you didn't get your mission calls in the mail. In fact, that was one of the reasons that people attend a general conference just to find out <laughs> uh, who was being called and whether they might be called. And so uh, he had been led to believe that he would be called at that general conference on a mission, something he had always wanted to do. And yet when the church secretary called out the names of the new missionaries, his name was not called. Deeply disappointing. Had the patriarch misspoken? The failure to hear his name in the tabernacle set him adrift. And in his disorientation, he began to sort of wonder, question, consider alternatives. He later says that he starts reading the works of Robert Ingersoll, who at the time was, was one of the most famous agnostics. After not receiving the mission call as he had planned on. President Grant he started to hang around with kind of a rougher crowd. He uh, let some of his standards drop and he actually started to read uh, books that were anti-religion and in, that, in fact anti-Christ and he said he was uh, almost persuaded by them. But during that time period his bishop noticed his struggle and gave him a church calling which changed his life. What Heber didn't know was that the general authorities had decided against sending him, noting that he was already performing a very splendid mission in providing for his widowed mother. Of this time, Heber recalled, I was tempted for several years to renounce my faith in the gospel because this blessing was not fulfilled. The spirit would come over me that the patriarch had lied to me and that I should throw the whole business away. I stood, as it were, on the brink of usefulness or upon the brink of making a failure of my life. There were several factors that brought Heber out of his season of doubt and disappointment. First was the mere presence of his mother. He knew deep inside that she still needed him there to care for her, and she had always been so self-sacrificing in his behalf. Maybe the most important thing, however, that lifted Heber from his disappointment about not being called on a mission was romance. When he set his financial goals as a young man, he had also set a goal to be married by the time he was 21. With that birthday just a year and a half away, Heber intensified his courting efforts. To the north of the Grant home, Jedediah's home, was the home of Daniel Wells. And part of Daniel Wells' family was this young 
bright, vivacious girl by the name of Emily. Heber would later say that he could never remember a time in his life when he wasn't drawn to Emily. Emily was attracted to Heber as well, but she seemed unhurried regarding marriage. And she also said she would never enter into plural marriage. That caused Heber to rethink the entire scenario. And he made the decision that he cannot marry Emily and fulfill his religious duties. But despite his decision, Heber was heartbroken. He remembered... It was a great shock to me at the time and caused me to shed some very bitter tears. One of the greatest trials of my life. At length, Heber turned to Lucy Stringham, another 13th Ward neighbor. He thought her to be one of the handsomest girls in the ward. She was happy, cheerful, and like Heber, a hard worker. She is bright, she's intelligent, she is very much a homemaker, uh, has executive ability. I think in now, in our time, she would have had a very bright career out of, out of the house, out of the home. She, uh, she provides Elder Grant with ballast. Um, he seeks her out in almost all his business decisions. At first, Lucy was cool to Heber's advances, but soon came to love him with all her heart. His friends encouraged him to get married by the bishop and sealed later when the Salt Lake Temple was completed. Heber, however, felt it was important to be married in the temple from the very beginning. In order to do this, Heber and Lucy made the long journey to the St. George Temple, where they were sealed for time and eternity on November 1, 1877. And once again, Heber had reached his goal. Back at work, Heber's star was rising. When the owners of the insurance company where he worked moved out of state, Heber bought the business. He quickly parlayed it into a thriving brokerage firm as well. Still in his early 20s, Heber J. Grant became a well-known businessman with powerful connections across the state and beyond. A typical wage earner of the day made $500 annually, but Heber made $5,000 a year. Having found success in business, Heber J. now turned his attention to politics with hopes of becoming Salt Lake's mayor, a congressman, or even a United States senator. He commented, I read reports every day of the proceedings of Congress about as faithfully as I would say my prayers. But when he was 23, Heber's life took a very unexpected turn. Instead of pursuing a position in state or national government, he found himself serving as the new president of the Tooele, Utah State. Even in those days, being called as a stake president at the age of 23 was unique. But to be imported into a stake? That was almost unheard of. But here came this dapper, city-fied young man, and the rural people of Tooele hardly knew what to think. They didn't even know who Heber J. Grant was. On October 30, 1880, Heber J. Grant was presented in stake conference to the Tooele Saints by the prophet John Taylor and his two counselors, Joseph F. Smith and George Q. Cannon. Additional testimonial of Heber's ability was given by Bishop Edwin Woolley of the 13th Ward. Nevertheless, when it came time to sustain their new leader, at least a quarter of the congregation abstained and some voted in opposition. Then Heber himself addressed the congregation. I told everything I could think of in seven minutes and a half, and part of that twice over. I announced to the good people that I had little or no knowledge whatsoever of the duties or responsibilities of a president of a stake, but I pledged to them my very best efforts. Upon finishing his remarks, however, Heber heard a great deal of grumbling from the Tooele Saints. Of this, he wrote, There was only one living man who had any right to complain about my being made president of the state, and that person was Heber J. Grant. 
Following the meeting when Heber had been announced as the new stake president in Tooele, they had a, a get-together, a dinner at the home of Francis Lyman, who was the outgoing stake president. And at that dinner, they talked a little bit about Heber's remarks at the meeting. President Joseph F. Smith, who was a counselor in the first presidency, commented that he had noticed that Heber had not borne his testimony that he knew that the gospel was true. And Heber commented, well, I, I don't know that the gospel is true. I believe with all my heart that the gospel is true, but I don't know. And Joseph F. Smith commented that he wasn't sure that they should have a stake president that didn't know that the gospel was true and recommended that they undo the ordination. President John Taylor listened to their comments and pondered for a moment and, and then responded, I don't think we should undo the ordination. I believe that Heber knows that the gospel is true. The only thing he doesn't know is that he knows it. Feeling inadequate and seeing his dream slip away for the sake of presiding over a people who didn't want him, Heber forlornly reflected, Goodbye, Mr. Mayor. Goodbye, Congress. Goodbye, political ambitions of every kind. If I behave myself, I'll be buried alive down in Tooele. The beginning of his ministry as stake president was a difficult one. In the weeks leading up to his being presented to the Tooele Saints, Heber suffered painful boils resulting from contact with poison ivy. At this same time, Lucy gave birth to their second daughter, and both mother and baby were having difficulty recovering. Following Heber's sustaining, the trials seemed only to increase. A vinegar works that he invested in burned to the ground. His expenses increased while his income plummeted. He began to push himself late into the night, and as a result, he suffered for a time with insomnia and nervous convulsions. However, Heber remained ever faithful and set about meeting the Tooele Saints knowing that if he did his part, the Lord would pull him through. As the young leader traveled through the stake, the members came to appreciate his common sense and unique ability, and Heber learned to love their humble pioneering faith. The Tooele Stake covered most of the valleys and communities west of the Ochre Mountains and the Great Salt Lake. But oddly enough, it also included the community of Oakley, Idaho, on the Utah-Idaho border. The journey to visit the Oakley Saints took President Grant and his party nearly two weeks all told. On one such journey, Heber sat beside Elder Francis Lyman, then a member of the Twelve, and Elder Lyman sang hymns for much of the journey. So inspired was Heber that he determined again to learn to sing. As a child of ten, Heber had tried to learn to sing, but unfortunately discovered that he was tone deaf. His voice teacher at the time told him he could sing, but added, I would like to be at least 40 miles away when you're doing it. Learning to sing became one of Heber's lifelong pursuits. His daughter, Frances, spoke of his commitment. When he was practicing, he would just play a note on the piano with one finger and practice and practice. There are two theories concerning tone deafness. The first theory is that a person actually is tone deaf and has a very, very difficult time or almost impossible for them to learn to match pitch. The second school of thought says that a person has a very difficult time hearing, matching pitch, and singing, but can be taught and can learn to do this through very diligent practice. Heber J. Grant must have had an incredible desire to learn to sing because it would take a lot of time, a lot of practice, a lot of dedication on his part and on the part of his teacher. A distinct memory I have going in and out of grandmother and grandfather's home was grandfather at the piano. So often he sat at the piano with his one finger accompaniment singing the hymns of the church. And he marked the hymns that he sang and the dates when he sang them. And I Need Thee Every Hour has the most notations of dates. True to his character, President Grant persisted and at one point sang 115 hymns in one day. While serving as the Tooele Stake President, 
Heber also received a most precious blessing from the stake patriarch, John Roberry. Following the wonderful blessing, Patriarch Roberry remarked, Heber, there were things which I saw that I dared not say. Heber, too, had received the startling inspiration that he would someday become the president of the church. Clearly, Heber was a leader in training. He was a leader with tremendous potential, and his heart and mind were being shaped for the challenges and blessings the future would hold. On the morning of October 16, 1882, less than two years since his call to the stake presidency, Heber J. Grant received a telegram asking him to attend a 3.30 p.m. council meeting in President John Taylor's office. At the meeting, President Taylor read a revelation announcing Heber's appointment to the Council of the Twelve. At 25 years old, he was the first native Utah to be called to the Twelve. Heber's doubts upon being called as a stake president seemed tiny compared to his present dilemma. For the next few months, he suffered from intense self-doubt. Then in February of 1883, Heber accepted an assignment to join Elder Brigham Young Jr. of the Twelve and several other brothers in preaching to the Navajo Indians of northern Arizona. As the party traveled through the arid desert, Heber's mind turned to the lingering doubts about his recent call to the apostleship. Having excused himself from the group, Heber found himself in quiet solitude, where he experienced a divine manifestation. He recalled, I seem to see and I seem to hear what to me is one of the most real things in all my life. It was given to me that the prophet Joseph Smith and my father requested that I be called to a position in the Twelve. I sat there and wept for joy. It was given to me that I had done nothing to entitle me to that exalted position except that I had lived a clean, sweet life. Finally convinced that his call as an apostle was genuine, Heber began to ponder how he could be of greatest use to the church. He knew he had a rare gift for business and wondered if his talents might be used to help the church become more solvent. Indeed, Heber's mere presence among the Quorum of the Twelve gave the church entree where it had none before. After Heber's ordination as an apostle, one prominent non-LDS businessman said, I never thought very much of the leaders of the Mormon people. In fact, I thought they were a very bright, keen, designing lot of fellows, getting rich from the ties that they gathered from a lot of ignorant, superstitious, and overzealous religious people. But now that you are one of the 15 men at the head of the Mormon church, I apologize to the other 14. I know if there were anything crooked in the management of the Mormon church, you would give it all away. Brigham Young had often preached the value of what he called home industry, so that the saints could be less dependent on the Gentile world. It was a natural fit, and Elder Grant began to see this as his apostolic niche. Working tirelessly, Heber developed more than a dozen new businesses in behalf of himself and the church. Among them were the Consolidated Wagon and Machine Company, the State Bank of Utah, Home Fire of Utah, and the Utah Sugar Company. In 1884, after a seven-month courtship and with Lucy's permission, Heber took a second wife, Hulda Augusta Winters. Two days later, he would be sealed to a third, Emily Wells, the darling of his youth, who had since become converted to the doctrine of plural marriage. A man who was very articulate, learned, and would later become a member of the Quorum of the Twelve begins to court Emily. 
And he understands that he isn't going to get very far with Emily unless she understands plural marriage. He converts her to plural marriage. Emily's response is, okay, um, if I'm going to enter into plural marriage, it will not be with you. <laughs> it will be with Heber. As Elder Grant's family grew, so did his finances. The Grant household, which included his mother, Rachel, became a home of comfort, cheerfulness, and cultural refinement. His daughter, Ludi, remembered. What a jubilant time we had when he came home. We would all gather around and listen to his experiences. <laughs> I can see him now, walking around the house with a child on each foot or tossing the children up on his knee. The panic of 1893 caused wide unemployment throughout our nation. It hurt, hit Utah early, and there were two main reasons for this. One is the Edmunds Tucker Law, which was passed in 1887, a law to stop plural marriage. Many leaders of our church were incarcerated as a result. Also, the church was disincorporated. The second reason was the church tried to help with resources and employment and to help Latter-day Saints to the point that they overextended their credit. Heber found himself overextended as well. Comfort was quickly replaced by crushing debt, from which his family would never fully recover. With the church at the edge of extinction, Wilford Woodruff issued a manifesto which put an end to the practice of plural marriage. But it was too late to save the saints from extreme hardship, and the church was suffering under the weight of its own financial burdens. The banks in Utah were on the brink of failure. In the summer of 1893, Heber was dispatched to the east to renew the church's short-term credit. After a few months, the situation looked impossible. Back in Utah, there was a run on the banks, leaving the church literally on the verge of bankruptcy. But on the morning of September 2nd, after three hours of sleep, Heber woke with a new impression. I recalled a blessing that I had had from President Joseph F. Smith, in which he promised me that I would meet with success far beyond what I had expected. I knelt down by my bed and asked the Lord with faith for fulfillment of the promise. Elder Grant offered to forfeit his life in exchange for a way of preserving the church's finances. He then rose from his bed and took to the streets of New York. He recalled, I walked downtown with no idea of where to go or what to do. I walked into the office of Blake Brothers and Company, where I met Mr. John Claflin. Claflin, a longtime acquaintance and a wealthy New York merchant, listened as Elder Grant explained the plight of the saints. An hour later, Heber left with a guarantee of $200,000. I felt to testify that the Lord had made good the promise of his servant. The church had navigated one of its most difficult hours. Heber Wells, the first governor of the state of Utah, said of Elder Grant, In times of panic and in times of plenty, Heber J. Grant has been able to raise a few dollars or millions where other men have failed to raise any amount. In the midst of the church's financial difficulties, Heber was also dealing with personal tragedy. His first wife, Lucy, was dying. One of the most emotional moments of President Grant's life is how he deals with this wife whom he loves deeply as he watches her die. Uh, he gets her the very finest medical uh, attention. In fact, uh, for some months she's hospitalized in, in San Francisco. President Grant literally lives at the hospital. Um, people remark how nourishing he is, solicitous of her. When he couldn't be at her side, he showered her with letters. Heber's daughter Lucy, or Ludi as she was called, remembered. Almost every day a letter reached Mother, and if for some reason it was delayed, even the nurses would notice it. I remember the head nurse saying to Mother that in all her years of nursing, 
She had never had any man treat his wife as considerately as mother was treated. Lucy was especially distraught. She could not understand why her father could not use his priesthood to heal her mother. Heber's inability to comfort her was crushing. I knelt down by the bed of my dying wife and told the Lord that I did not complain because my wife was dying, but that I lacked the strength to see my wife die and have her death affect the faith of my children. I therefore pleaded with him to give my daughter Lucy a testimony that it was his will that her mother should die. Hours later, Lucy was gone. Heber recalled what followed. My little boy, Heber, commenced weeping bitterly, and Lucy put her arms around him and kissed him and told him not to cry, that the voice of the Lord had said to her, In the death of your mama, the will of the Lord will be done. Lucy knew nothing of my prayers. I have never ceased to be grateful. Another important note about the death of Lucy Grant was related to the timing of when she died. When Heber and Lucy had been married 15 years earlier, they, had, uh, they were recommended by their friends that they be married by their bishop in Salt Lake City and then later be sealed in the Salt Lake Temple, which was still under construction. Heber felt very strongly, though, that he wanted to be sealed in the temple, and so they journeyed to St. George to be sealed which was not an easy journey at the time. Um, now, when Lucy passes away 15 years later, the Salt Lake Temple is still not completed. Had they waited to do the sealing, as their friends were encouraging them to do, they would not have had the opportunity to be sealed together in this life. Not long after losing his dear Lucy, Elder Grant would face another sore trial in losing his only sons. In 1895, Daniel Wells Grant would die before reaching four years old. And Elder Grant's namesake, Heber Stringham Grant, who suffered with a disease that affected his hip, would pass the following year at the age of seven. During Heber's lifetime, he lost two wives, two sons, and later a daughter, my mother, who died in 1929, about a month after I was born. It's astonishing to think of what Heber went through during his first 13 years as an apostle. By 1896, it seems that he'd been through the refiner's fire. If there was anyone who was ready for the new hope that a new century brings, it was Heber J. Grant. At the turn of the century, the course of Heber's life had been charted. He would be a churchman all his days. But there was one outstanding issue. He could not get the taste for politics out of his mouth, and he was not alone in his desire. People who knew him and knew his ability kept pressing him to run. As Utah prepared for statehood in 1895, the Democratic Party invited Heber to run for governor. He wrote, I wanted to be the first governor of the state of Utah as much as I ever wanted anything in my life. The leadership of the church had determined at this point that they were not going to run for political office. So when Heber J. Grant was approached to run for governor, you can imagine there was a bit of pause for him because deep down inside, Heber J. Grant had always wanted to be the governor. So he decided rather than just summarily make the decision himself, he would go in and ask President Woodruff what he thought he should do. So he took this note in to President Woodruff. And he'd be a shoe in if he ran. Everybody expected he would win. And President Woodruff just sort of sat there. And they'd had the discussions before, not individually, but they'd discussed it as a quorum. President Woodruff looked at him and he said, well, you know the answer to that. And that pretty much ended Hubert J. Grant's aspirations to run for governor. Despite President Woodruff's stern reply, Heber could not help entertaining the notion when the Democrats came back to him a few years later and offered him the nomination for U.S. Senator. The mining magnate Alf McCune was the leading candidate, and they just could not get the necessary votes to get McCune elected. And so the power brokers uh, scurried around to see if they could find a compromise candidate. 
And there was talk on the street that the ideal compromise candidate would be Heber J. Grant. But then Heber has to decide really whether he wants to do this. So he goes to his office and he goes through this personal dialogue. Why should I accept this invitation? He says, the reason I want this call is pride, P-R-I-D-E. So he walks out of that dialogue with himself and he decides to decline the invitation. In 1900, during a meeting of the Twelve, George Q. Cannon announced that the First Presidency had decided to open a mission in Japan. Hearing the news, Heber felt strongly that he would be called to preside there. However, Heber was still deeply in debt. He had recently calculated that it would take him and his family with all their incomes combined ten years before they became free and clear. Yet just as this thought was passing through Heber's mind, he was called to preside over the new Japanese mission. For the next few minutes, the brethren queried Elder Grant about his finances, but he calmly assured them that he was up to the job. As they left the room that day, fellow apostle John W. Taylor took Heber aside and said, You have made a sacrifice today that is equal, financially speaking, Abraham offering up Isaac. I prophesy that you shall be blessed of the Lord and make enough money to go to Japan a free man financially. Heber obeyed, and in four short months, he had raised sufficient funds to pay off his debts and also provide for his needs during a three-year mission to Japan. And so on July 24, 1901, Elder Grant, with three missionaries in tow, departed for Japan. The party traveled by train to Vancouver, British Columbia, where they embarked on the ship, the Empress of India, which was destined for Yokohama, Japan. On September 1, 1901, the four missionaries gathered in a secluded spot outside Yokohama. Here, Elder Grant offered a special prayer, dedicating the land of Japan for the preaching of the gospel. Unfortunately, after such an auspicious start, the missionaries found the work in Japan intolerably slow. The Japanese people seemed more interested in the commercial value of learning the English language than in the gospel message. Elder Grant, however, had no reciprocal feeling about the Japanese tongue. The Japanese could not understand their own language when I spoke it. But Heber was smitten by Japanese kindness and courtesy, their devotion to family, and their tenacious work ethic. After seven months, however, they had baptized only two young men, and one of them quickly withered into inactivity. Also during this time, Elder Grant received word of the passing of his dear friend, President Lorenzo Snow. Early in 1902, Elder Grant returned temporarily to Salt Lake to report on their work in the Orient and also to visit his family and conduct some business affairs. Speaking with President Smith and the other brethren, Elder Grant described the difficulty of the work in Japan but remained hopeful for the future. After three months in the U.S., Elder Grant returned to the work in Japan. However, this time he took with him his wife Augusta, their young daughter Mary, and four additional elders. Deprived of the fruits of abundant convert baptisms, Elder Grant laid his emphasis on other prime areas of his ministry, the training and development of his missionaries. After a second year and only one more convert baptism, Elder Grant sought the Lord for help. Feeling that I was not accomplishing anything, I went out into the woods and got down on my knees and told the Lord that whenever he was through with me in Japan, I would be very glad and thankful if he would call me home and send me to Europe to preside over the European mission. Within days, Elder Grant received a cable from Salt Lake City asking him to return. His call to preside over the European mission had been confirmed. He departed Japan having planted many precious seeds that following World War II would sprout into vast congregations of faithful Japanese saints. 
When he went to Japan and was called to preside over that mission, he struggled to learn the language. Uh, he never did learn it. And I've always felt that that was the place that he learned to rely on the Spirit. That experience began to prepare him to become the prophet, to realize that you don't depend on yourself, you have to depend on the Lord and the Spirit to do that. His experience at succeeding at anything at which he persisted became seriously tested on this Japanese mission. It was the first time that which we persist in doing didn't work. It was a humbling experience for him, but it was, in fact, the turning point in his career as an apostle. He was called to Japan after he had been in the Quorum for 18 years. A little less than 18 years later, he would become the seventh president of the church. Newly upon arrival in Japan, the church was attacked in the press, and he discovered from the beginning that he would be involved in defending the church in the press. Those two contributing factors was a pivotal experience in his career for the church. He weaned himself away from the church's business affairs and became involved in the saving of souls. After attending the October General Conference in Salt Lake, where his call to Europe was officially announced, Elder Grant departed for England, this time with Emily and four of his daughters in company. His 114 missionaries in the British Isles adored him as he inspired such enthusiasm for the work. While 48 years old, it seemed like he was working harder than any young elder in the mission. At a conference which assembled all the elders in Great Britain, President Grant spoke with great power. Many experienced a Pentecostal outpouring of the Spirit. A young elder, Hugh B. Brown, remembered the meeting. It was the best, most spirited conference I have ever attended. Most every elder wept with joy. Elder Grant traveled widely, not only through England, where he personally supervised the work, but also to Holland, Germany, and Scandinavia. However, his railroad accommodations, like those of the young missionaries, were usually third class. Of this frugal measure, he joked, You know, people ask why Mormons always travel third class. That's because there is no fourth class. <laughs> While visiting Stockholm with an entourage, Elder Grant made the audacious, spur-of-the-moment suggestion that they visit King Oscar of Sweden. He had come with letters of recommendation from the senators and governor of Utah, to which he quickly added his own letter of introduction. Heber arrived there, and they said, no, he doesn't have time to meet with you. Well, true to Heber J. Grant's character, he persisted, and he just stayed and waited and waited, and eventually, the King of Sweden appeared. And there was this controversy over whether or not they were going to allow the LDS missionaries to preach in their country. And he decided to send his personal representatives to America to see how the Swedish people were being treated who had immigrated to America. And he reported to Heber J. Grant that his representatives had said to him that of all the Swedish immigrants that they had talked with, that it was those who had settled with the LDS people who had been the most comfortable, the happiest, who had been treated the best. And so he said to Heber J. Grant with his request, certainly we will allow your LDS missionaries here to talk with our people. In December of 1907, Elder Grant and his family returned home after three exhilarating and certainly successful years in the European mission. In Salt Lake, Elder Grant immediately commenced the building of a new family home, which he had promised his wife Emily before leaving for Europe. But not long after the house was completed, Emily passed away, succumbing to the effects of cancer on May 25, 1908.
For the next eight years, Elder Grant used his position as an apostle to promote good causes, especially those that benefited the aged and needy. During World War I, his leadership in state bond drives made Utah a national leader. His personal appeals were forceful. On no issue was he more forceful, however, than the word of wisdom, specifically the prohibition of alcohol. Heber J. Grant was no longer a green apostle. He had served for 34 years in the Quorum of the Twelve, but still he chose the assignments that took him to the far-flung stakes of Zion. On one such tour, he traveled a great distance by buggy with elders Rudger Clausen and J. Golden Kimball. He asked his brethren if there were any objections to his singing 100 hymns that day. They laughed and said there were none. But hours later, they were not so jovial. Heber remembered. After I had sung about 40, they assured me that if I sang the remaining 60, they would have a nervous breakdown. I paid no attention whatsoever to their appeal, but held them to their bargain and sang the full 100. In November of 1916, Heber's mentor and fellow apostle Francis Lyman died. And so on November 18th, Elder Heber J. Grant, at the age of 60, was ordained as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. He was filled with humility. I don't think I have ever in my life felt my weakness more than I do today. As president of the Twelve, Heber worked closely with President Joseph Fielding Smith. However, after Heber had only been 18 months in office, President Smith's health began to fail. Knowing that President Smith was not well, President Grant stopped by to visit him, but to his surprise, he was ushered in immediately to talk with the prophet, being told that this might be his last chance. As they visited briefly, President Smith took Heber by the hand and said, The Lord bless you, my boy. You have a great responsibility. The words President Smith spoke that night would strengthen Elder Grant and stay with him for the rest of his life. I thank God for the remark made to me, the last remark he made before he passed on, by Joseph F. Smith. The Lord knows who he wants to have stand at the head of his people, and the Lord never makes any mistake. On November 19, 1918, President Smith died, and 62-year-old Heber J. Grant was set apart as the church's seventh prophet, seer, and revelator, the first native Utah to become president of the church. The saints were familiar with and very fond of Elder Grant, but his simple, straightforward approach as prophet was disconcerting to some. Much of his teaching was by way of personal anecdote, something the saints were not used to. And President Grant himself was fully aware of the saints' feelings. He said of this time, Some of our wisest and most faithful and diligent Latter-day Saints felt that it was almost a calamity when I came to the presidency. But in time, the church came to feel at ease with President Grant's approach. He earned their respect, just as he had earned the respect of the saints in Tooele, by example and hard work. President Grant was determined to improve the image of the church. While the public's impression of it had improved since the days of polygamy, misconceptions about the Mormons persisted. For many, the Mormons were still a mysterious religious group tucked away in the Rocky Mountains. President Grant's folksy charm, which some had considered a weakness, became the church's most effective tool in bringing greater esteem and attention to the name Latter-day Saint. Because of his business connections, President Grant made contact with the outer world. Uh, he was comfortable with the outer world. He could speak their language. 
And because of that, uh, he was remarkably successful in making friends for the church. I remember being in the tabernacle when Helen Keller was in Salt Lake City. And Grandfather presented her with a Braille copy of the Book of Mormon. President Grant encouraged and accepted every opportunity to speak to the most popular clubs and societies of the day. He personally guided prominent businessmen and political leaders through Salt Lake City and Utah. And he also cultivated friendships with presidential candidates, national newspaper editors, and visited four U.S. presidents at the White House. President Grant had a unique ability to get people who were not members of the church to listen to him. They were galvanized by his personality. He was a phenomenon. Uh, he was an extremely likable person. In fact, uh, one of the greatest admirers of President Grant was one of the prominent uh, industrialist capitalists of the day, Henry Ford. President Grant meets with Henry Ford, best buddies. The two of them just got along famously. Uh, they were on the same wavelength. And they had the same vibes. One of the first Model A cars was presented to uh, President Grant here in Utah. The fact that uh, you have this Mormon leader on Time magazine uh, suggests uh, his national following. Within the church, President Grant made huge strides as well. In the first year of his presidency, Heber J. Grant dedicated the Hawaii Temple. Then, in subsequent years, he dedicated the temples in Alberta, Canada and Mesa, Arizona. And despite his earlier certainty that President Smith would live to preside over the church's centennial celebrations, it was President Grant who enjoyed that privilege. Five years later, he also participated in the dedication of a monument at the Hill Cumorra. After the recession that followed World War I, America entered a wonderful age of innovation. President Grant was dazzled. It is marvelous and wonderful how the gospel is being heard and proclaimed for thousands of miles in all directions over the radio. I used to wonder how it would be possible for every ear to hear. I rejoice in this invention. In 1926, Idaho Mormon Philo T. Farnsworth invented the television. But if the Gilded Age offered great possibilities, it also offered challenges. In the late 1920s, President Grant began to feel very uneasy about the financial future. So he and the leaders of the church began to place renewed emphasis on caution and living within one's means. But in October of 1929, the stock market crashed. Before long, the Great Depression of the 1930s was in full tide. President Grant's cautions to the members of the church helped cushion the blow a little, but Utah reeled along with the rest of the states under the impact of America's greatest economic disaster. President Grant, and particularly his counselor, President Clark, worked to develop a program that would strengthen these pioneer values of self-sufficiency, of avoiding a handout from the government. The church security program or welfare program, as it was later named, differed from the government program in an essential way. The New York Tribune took note of this, saying, Men are being encouraged to support themselves, not alone for economic reasons, but because of the spiritual and moral advantage of standing on their own feet, instead of being what the people of Utah call leaners. By the end of the 30s, the church, under the leadership and guidance of President Grant, appeared to have weathered the storm. In 1940, while on a trip to California, President Grant suffered a series of strokes. He would never regain full function of his left side, but due to his persistence, he did improve. Nevertheless, for someone who had been physically active all his life, the physical limitations were frustrating, and he could be stubborn about taking advice from doctors who wanted to limit his work schedule. He wrote, The doctor had allowed me two hours a day. I spent four hours and twenty minutes one day, and I felt so fine that after dinner I went down to the doctor's office to insist on having four hours a day only to be sent home and sent to bed. 
he discovered that my blood pressure had gone out of sight, and so I have not tried to fool him since. Despite his disabilities, President Grant was at peace. These last few years of President Grant's life were a real gift to him. It gave him a chance to ponder the past, reflect, and to perhaps really enjoy some of his uh, memories and uh, thoughts of his experiences of the past. There was, I think, a beauty in those last years. Much of the everyday affairs of the church he couldn't perform because of his weakness, but it was a time that he could just sort of step back from his life and sense what had been accomplished. And it was a time when uh, his close friends in the community could honor him. Heber remembered this time in his life by recording. I find that as the years mature with me, the mellowing influences of time soften down whatever was rough and jagged in my life and leave me with recollections that are sweet beyond measure. The past becomes as gloriously colored a reality as the visions of the future. Though he had accepted his physical limitations, President Grant continued to deepen his commitment to the core of the gospel, as well as his charity and kindness to others. I know of no man that I'm aware of that uh, exemplifies, personifies the values of charity, personal kindness, uh, like President Grant. He was a very generous man. He gave away everything he didn't accumulate. He made several fortunes, I think, in his life. And when he died, he was not a rich man. He had given it all away. Joseph Anderson, President Grant's secretary and the steward of his finances and personal affairs, spoke of the prophet's giving heart. President Grant was the most liberal and generous man with his personal means that I have ever known. Invariably, he would ask me to draw a check for a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, telling me to make the check in favor of some widow whose name he would give, explaining that he wished to pay off the mortgage on her home. His only desire was to have money that he might do good with it. One of the great treasures that people have in their homes are these beautiful books. They, they could be religious, they could be poetry, and in it there's a beautiful script of Heber J. Grant, a beautiful signature. Heber J. Grant was absolutely generous in giving away hundreds, maybe a thousand books in his lifetime. And it just shows you this other side of Heber J. Grant, always willing to give of himself and also to give things that he thought would just make life a little bit nicer and to thank people. On May 14, 1945, at the age of 88, Heber J. Grant quietly passed to the other side of the veil. His death symbolized the passing of an era. I was 16 when grandfather died, and I remember the day vividly. The way they notified people of news was by putting out an extra edition of the newspaper. And my cousin and I were walking to help our pain, shall we call it, and we would hear the newspaper boys calling, Extra! Extra! Heber J. Grant dies. And we were quite emotional. We were young and just let it flow. Tributes from church members and non-Mormon admirers alike poured in from across the nation and around the world. As his funeral beer passed the Catholic Cathedral of the Madeleine, its bells rang out in a show of reverence and condolence. He was buried near his father, a man he never knew but deeply admired. Had young Heber measured up? Yeah. I think he far out surpassed his father in achievement and contribution. Here is a man who personifies strength, who personifies virtue. All that is bequeathed to the next generation. It's very much a part of us today as a people that we owe to President Grant. May the Lord bless us and guide us by his spirit. I pray God for you, one and all, to love this gospel. 
Why, it's worth everything else in the wide, wide world. I pray God to bless each and every one of us that has a knowledge of the divinity of this work. May we grow and increase in that knowledge, and above all, may we live it, that our lives can proclaim it, is my humble prayer. And I ask it in the name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen.